Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, to the first edition of the Science Education Day here at IST Austria. My name is Stefan Bernhardt, and I I'll be the master of ceremony uh, of this evening. Um, the people from the bus will stroll in. Um, maybe I use the time and talk about the relevance of science education for three quarters of an hour. No, I won't do that, uh, because we have a much more relevant person to talk about the motivation, why we want to go into the field of science education, and that is our president. So please, Tom, maybe you take the place at the lectern and for your welcome words. Thank you. Particular our guests uh, of honor here, uh, Jakob Kalice, uh, the Secretary General of the Federal Ministry of Education, Science and Research. Thank you. <laughs> Indre Collini, a member of the Parliament of Lower Austria, welcome. welcome. <laughs> Maria Theresia Eder, uh, here, okay, so uh, the, from the City Council of Kloster Neuburg. Okay. <laughs> Erwin Rauscher, Director of the University College for Teacher Education in Lower Austria. And, <laughs> and, and two of his vice rectors. So, welcome, everybody. Uh, you know, we are, we are an institution of basic research. We do here uh, 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 science at the cutting edge, and we are very grateful that we have here a place where we can have the freedom to focus fully on science and to create an environment where we really uh, can, uh, can concentrate on scientific excellence and scientific creativity. So it may seem strange at first, why, uh, why are we interested in science education? Uh, if you know scientists, you will not find this strange at all. We actually also, most scientists share a passion uh, uh, to, to really get, uh, share the, the fascination with science and with, with, for science and for creating new knowledge and uh, to explain why science is, uh, is such a fascinating uh, activity and also such an important activity for society. To share this with the public is one of, uh, I mean, most scientists uh, 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 find this extremely important and also interesting. So it's a very natural fit for us. And we have, even though we are rather young, we have already have, you know, uh, several formats for outreach activities that, know, um, that we now have, have, have done for many years. Uh, there's every year we have an open campus. It will come up actually on next Sunday if you want to come back here on Sunday with your family, with your kids. We expect, as usual, more than 2,000 people here. And uh, you will be able to see the labs from the inside and also have many, share many other activities uh, on campus. We have every summer, also this summer, we, uh, we organize um, a summer campus uh, with a science theme. Uh, for primary school uh, uh, kids, this is actually uh, together uh, with, um, yeah, with the Pädagogische Hochschule here. And uh, we, we organize many school visits, have extracurricular programs for teenagers, and many other activities for outreach. Now we have decided to really put the focus on this whole uh, bundle of activity to start a an, uh, science uh, education day uh, in order to uh, provide a forum for the exchange of ideas uh, of how to do better science education, an exchange between, that has to happen between scientists, uh, between educators, teachers, representatives of the public authorities, science communicators, and everybody else who is interested from the public. Uh, so we want to not only share what it is, the science that's done at ISD Austria, but also how science and the scientific method works and uh, why it is important, how knowledge is produced. Another topic that's very important today is, you know, what, what information is real and reliable and what is fake. Uh, 
The fast technical progress, of course, makes this all more difficult. I only mentioned here the, the, the keyword digitalization. And it's also, it's also therefore even more important that scientific literacy and critical thinking are actually things that are taught in school from very early on. Uh, this is really essential for us in the end to become uh, a, a, a better society, to help uh, uh, people make better use of new technologies and also to take away the fear they may have from new technologies and, and, and new knowledge. So uh, let me mention one more activity will actually in this direction that is a big project for us that is going to come up. We're actually planning uh, a, a visitor center right outside this, this uh, lecture hall, which will become, a, uh, the hope is that it will become a mini science museum with exhibits of the science that goes on here at, at this institute. And here we hope to attract then also, uh, especially f schools during the week and uh, families on the weekends. Uh, and also, as I uh, already said, the Science Education Day is new, and we hope to make it an annual event with this being the first edition. As, uh, in, uh, and uh, during these Science Education Days, we hope to learn uh, from each other and also from role models out there in the world of how to do better science education. And it's uh, no big surprise that actually I is the Austria's biggest role model on the scientific side. Uh, is the, uh, which is the Weizmann Institute in Israel, uh, is also uh, a, a fantastic role model for science education. Therefore, I'm particularly glad here today to be able to welcome uh, Liat Ben David from the Davidson Institute, which is the science education wing, so to speak, of, of, of the Weizmann Institute. And I'm really mu very much looking forward to hear uh, what you... But you will be able to tell us uh, 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 how, how you can succeed uh, in this endeavor. Uh, and uh, let me stop here. And yeah, OK. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> now I would like uh, to ask Jakob Kalice, um, Secretary General of the representing uh, our Federal Minister, Hans Fassmann, uh, in his capacity of uh, Secretary General of the Ministry of Education, Science and Research. For your welcome words, Jakob, we're very, very happy that you're here and like to share your thoughts and considerations concerning science education. Thank you. Thank you. Um, dear Professor Hensinger, distinguished guests, um, it's a great pleasure for me to address you um, uh, this evening on behalf of the Minister of Education, Science and Research, Heinz Fassmann. Unfortunately, he cannot be here because he's in, in France at a conference. Um, it is a pleasure for me, but um, probably I may not be the most authentic uh, example on successful science education when I think of my own past. When I was a pupil back in the 1990s, uh, I could not have uh, been more ignorant about um, science myself. Uh, when I was 18, when I remember when I left school, I uh, did not know what, sign, what a scientific method was, what scientific methods were, um, and what a crucial role really science plays in our society. Um, I won't tell you where I went to school. <laughs> it was in Lower Austria. <laughs> Statistically speaking, um, my former attitude is, is not an isolated approach uh, towards science and research, but rather on the contrary. Um, on average, uh, I looked into the numbers, only 44% of Europeans tell us that uh, they have, in what way, um, however, uh, ever uh, studied science and technology in school. So they tell us that this was not really a, a topic or an issue um, during their time at school. When you think uh, about that, when you think about biology class, physics class, and all of that, um, <laughs> uh, this is quite surprising, actually. Um, I also looked in the into the numbers um, in, in terms of age groups. Um, and fortunately, within the age group of 15 to 24 years old, year olds, 65% um, tell us that they have um, had this kind of uh, education, science education in school today. This is from 2014. So it seems to me something is, is uh, happening. There's, there's an improvement um, in this respect. 
And when I come back to my own experiences, um, uh, this observation is confirmed. When I look at my children, they are seven years old now, um, I see the following. Uh, they are naturally uh, curiosity-driven, just the way children are, but um, it's uh, uh, quite, a, or it was astonishing to me how the teachers in their school, and this is a public school in Vienna, um, and the daycare they are in, um, what a great job they are doing with respect to science, um, education, how they are fostering their curiosity, and there are these science workshops happening just all the time. Uh, they also make use of the initiatives the ministry has launched together with partners like the um, uh, Vienna Open Lab at the Vienna uh, Biocenter campus. Um, my children have been there twice uh, with their school already in this year. Um, and of course, uh, naturally, um, I, I try to motivate them as well. We went to the Lange Nacht Forschung, of course, a couple of weeks ago. We went to um, the Forschungsfest of Lower Austria, and they just love these, these things, so it really comes naturally to them. Natural to them. Um, and these are just uh, very few examples. Tom, you have mentioned some other things you do, and uh, there are many, many other outreach um, activities out there. Um, that uh, don't have anything to do um, directly with the ministry. We have our programs like Sparkling Science uh, and other things that we um, launch together with, with our partners like the ÖAD um, uh, a couple of years ago, but there is much, mu much more out, out there. Content-wise, there is also something happening apparently. The relation between science and society has changed, or is about to change, is changing. Civil society has moved somewhat closer towards um, science, not quite on eye level, but um, still. Um, and I think this title, the title of this event reflects this new relation. Engage, enrich, evolve. These terms speak of a certain appreciation of ideas of the citizens. This, this, um, uh, this is also one of the key issues uh, we tried to focus on in our open innovation strategy that we published two years ago as a ministry. Not everyone likes this uh, or favors this development, of course, but I think it helps to, um, um, to gain more acceptance and more understanding of science and research uh, in the public. Nevertheless, we are not quite where we need to be and where, where we want to be. Um, when we think of the attention that science and uh, research technology has received in the last couple of years, in the last 10 or 20 years or so, um, it's become yeah, one of the strategies for the future prosperity of, of Europe. Budgets are increasing constantly in the field of science and research. Uh, just now we are talking about the, um, the future budget of the future um, uh, research program of the European Union. Of course, the European Commission wants uh, more money in, in science and research, which of course, as the, um, from, a minist uh, from a ministry's uh, point of view, uh, is, would be very welcome uh, to us. So if science and research play such an important role in our society, um, we have to sh ensure that citizens um, kind of share this view and um, embrace, I think embrace, if you want um, something like uh, scientific progress, you mentioned it before, Tom, um, this, this uh, progress can be very fast and I think this is um, uh, a point where we need to invest. So I'm very glad that uh, the IST um, has entered the stage with its initiatives specifically on this issue of science education. I think this is very important. Um, and uh, I think it's important you do so because you, the IST is just becoming uh, an ever more important and more relevant player in the Austrian research and science landscape with its focus on, strong focus on excellence and uh, its very international orientation. Uh, so I think we can really benefit from this. Uh, so thank you, Tom, for initiating this event, and also thank you to the keynote speakers. Um, I think we can learn a lot, and it's uh, just a very good moment also uh, for this discussion. Uh, as you probably all know, 
um, the, uh, the, the way the um, uh, minist ministry is put together now, we joined science and education, and this gives us um, new perspectives, really, from a science point of view, of how we can um, make use of, of this field of education. Uh, this opens up a new possibilities for initiatives of bringing research into schools, also into schools um, that teach children who probably otherwise will not come into contact with science and research. So it's not surprising that my kids are in contact with uh, science and research, but I think what we should be thinking about is how um, uh, kids who are not uh, uh, close um, or won't have this possibility um, or this close engagement uh, with science and re research, how can we reach them? Um, and I think this very specific field of science education may, may um, uh, give us yeah, food for thought. So what, what I'm um, expecting, what I asked um, uh, uh, some coll colleagues also of the ministry is to um, listen eagerly and maybe there's one or another idea that we can pick up upon really tonight and maybe yeah, this starts a new kind of initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Jakob. Thank you very much for your words of welcome. Um, now I take the great privilege in announcing our first keynote speaker this evening. Um, Tom already uh, introduced uh, Liad bin David, Director General of the Weizmann Arm in Science Education, the Davidson Institute. Um, and I think this keynote perfectly goes well together with uh, <laughs> not this cartoon. <laughs> but with our motto of the evening, because it's really enriching uh, to listen to what you have accomplished so far. Uh, Liet, because of the time restraints we have, I do not introduce you as a person, uh, but ask you simply for the input uh, and for your keynote this evening. Thank you, Liet. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you so much for inviting me and I'd like to thank the IST for this wonderful opportunity to have a mutual discussion about something that is so near and dear to my heart and that is science education. Uh, I finished my PhD at the Weizmann Institute in 1991, that's two and a half years ago, <laughs> and I have been doing science education ever since. So I have dedicated my entire adult career to this uh, endeavor, and I would like to uh, put it into perspective both in what we do in Israel and what science education means. So, uh, yes, science education as a powerhouse for a better future for all, and I'm delighted to hear that here in Austria, the Ministry of Education and Science are one ministry. I'd love to discuss that later on. I think that's very important, but um, uh, there, I'm, I could give a whole lecture on why that should be, so uh, I'll do that some other time. Um, so first of all, why is uh, science education so important to us? Um, I could bring many quotes, I'm just going to settle for one because I have uh, 20 minutes, right? Okay. Um, and this isn't working. Okay. For some reason. This does not come off my time. No, definitely not. <laughs> Well, okay, I'll tell you what's going to be here in a minute. Uh, the ninth president of Israel, uh, Shimon Peres, uh, used to say that uh, human capital is the state of Israel's, in a minute, <laughs> is, uh, is actually the only asset that we have. We are a very small state with very few, almost no resources. And um, there you go. And uh, human capital is the most significant asset that we have. So investing in science education is not just a nice to have, it's not just any education, it's actually a strategic choice because investing in science education enables a meaningful uh, role for designing the future. Um, let's perceive that for a minute, let's go into that for a minute and try to figure out why science education is so important besides the fact of maybe it will produce the next scientists of the future. Having said that, let's look at the other reasons to do science education. First of all, 
every single day we have to make choices that are based on some kind of knowledge in science and technology, regardless if we're scientists or not. Do we uh, immunize our children or ourselves? Do we take that influenza immunization? Um, are we going to use turmeric in our food because it's healthy for us? Um, do we uh, support implants, human implants, medical choices? All of these choices we have to make every single day. Every citizen has to make them. And if we want them to be uh, informed uh, decisions, then we have to know how to understand something about science and technology. The next reason is that uh, science research is becoming more and more um, resourceful. It needs uh, human time, it needs uh, professionals, it needs a lot of resources in budgets. As you mentioned before, all of these endeavors are highly expensive and they need global consent each one of these uh, um, examples needs many countries to do them together. Science is becoming more and more complex. If we want countries to invest in these endeavors that are all for the benefit of, the man of mankind, these are all endeavors that are going to make our lives better, hopefully. Um, we need the policy and decision makers to understand why science and technology is beneficial and they need to understand something in science so that they don't stop these kind of endeavors. The third reason was already mentioned here as well, and that is pure and simple curiosity. Every one of us is born curious, and then at the, in the education system many times we kill that curiosity. So um, curious, how do we keep that curiosity going? Every two-year-old, anyone who has raised a two-year-old knows that they will ask again and again, why? How is this working? And when you give them the answer, they'll ask why again. So how do we use, how do we cultivate and harness that kind of curiosity for the betterment of their education? I finished my PhD, as I said, in 1991, and uh, it was in molecular biology, and then I decided that I'm going to work with people instead of test tubes. Uh, I like to talk, as you can see. And uh, I have captive audiences in the classroom, so I'm going to go into science education. And after 10 years of, uh, le after I left high school, I went back. And uh, during that decade, GPS was uh, invented. Uh, in, in vitro uh, fertilization was invented. Many new and exciting things were happening in the world. We had Microsoft, suddenly we had Windows on our computers. And then I went into the classroom and I said, this is something I remember. Nothing has changed. Well, there was one changed. Instead of having a black board with white chalk, there was a white board with black ink. That was a huge change. So I introduced myself to the classroom, and I said, I'm, my name is uh, Liat Ben David. I just finished my PhD at the Weizmann Institute of Science, number six uh, research institute in the world. And as I was talking, my students, my pupils, high school students, their eyes were growing until one of them just couldn't hold it back anymore. And he said, what on earth are you doing here? <laughs> now, when he said that, he was actually revealing two tragedies in my mind. First of all, he was saying, the education system doesn't have professionals like you who just finished such high-end research that these are not, this is not the regular profile of a teacher. But he was saying something else. He was also saying that during the years that he was in school, he wasn't thinking of himself as worthy of teachers like me, regardless if I'm a good teacher or not. But these are, this is not the, the kind of profile of the teachers or of the students of what they are entitled to. And um, this is no surprise because uh, frustration from the education system is not a new thing. This has been going on for more than a century. If we go back to Lewis Carroll from 1865 and we look at Alice in Wonderland, the way that he described school, that's why they call them lessons, because they lessen from day to day. <laughs> this is almost 200 years ago. And yet we continue to reform and to patch and to bring in new ideas to the system. It isn't working. The, 
we're, the frustration that we have from education systems is still going on. It's not such a big surprise. The education system was designed for the industrial age. We've, in every other aspect of our lives, we've forgotten the industrial age long ago. We've went through several ages since the industrial age, but the schools haven't. And if we really want to um, engage and encourage students to study and to be curious and to know what, the kind, what kind of world they're living in and to be involved in this world, we have to change the system. We have to leave the comfort zone and if we want to develop active, creative and innovative students who can, uh, were not only driven by curiosity and base their decisions on the scientific way of thinking, you were talking about the scientific method, you're right, that's what scientific, science education should be about. Not about facts and figures, but about the method of making decisions and living everyday uh, lives. And that they can thrive in the kind of world that we're living in, which is a dynamic, ever-changing environment if these are the kind of students that we want, then that's the kind of system that they should learn in. The system needs to role model what it wants the students to become. So uh, we uh, decided on four freedoms of education, which have been published by the Times of Israel and also uh, spoken about in one of my TEDx talks. Um, what are the four freedoms of education? What are the four fundamental basic rights of each and every student in each and every education system? And for those of you who are curious about this name, after the break, I will be happy to explain it, but not right now. Okay, so the first freedom that we're looking, if, if education is a basic right for every single citizen, what is that uh, built of? What are the uh, four things that we need to look at? First of all, freedom from coverage. Today, covering a curriculum is ridiculous. We are not uh, um, constrained anymore by time, space, or should we be constrained by a specific curriculum. We can find everything we want in the palms of our hands. We take it with us in our pockets. Why are we still teaching children to make fire out of stones when we have already passed even mass matches? Coverage in the day where we can study wherever we want, whatever we want, whenever we want, and we're still doing it as if we have to go to school every single day for 45 minute periods, five days a week or six days a week, we're not there anymore. The second freedom is freedom from standardization. Standardization kills individuality, curiosity, and pluralism. If there's something that we've learned in psychology in the 20th century, is that we are different people. We have different tendencies. We learn differently. We enjoy different things. Why are we asking us all to do the same standard kind of studying? And then we're testing standard, uh, through standards. We're taking a fish, a zebra, and a monkey, and we're asking them all to climb a tree, and there were, then we're grading them. That makes no sense. The fourth uh, freedom is the freedom to fail. We do not allow our students to fail. And yet science, and I'm sure that most of the scientists, at least in the crowd, will agree that most of the time we fail. We try all kinds of experiments, they don't work. We change them, we try something innovative out of the box and we do it again and again and again until it, work, until it works. So if we take that failure and we allow our kids to explore and experiment and discover, and then we harness that failure to develop them, to help them develop creative thinking and critical thinking, that is the way we develop creativity and thought. And the fourth freedom is the freedom to imagine. Storytelling, wonder, role models, all of these are the basic way of how to take uh, um, imagination and turn it into human development. So that is what we're doing or trying to do at the Davidson Institute of Science Education. Our vision is to make science or the scientific method a major leading value on both personal and social level of Israeli society for each and every citizen in Israel. That means our mission is, if the Weizmann Institute is 
number six in the world, as, as I said, in basic research, according to Nature Index, then the Davidson Institute of Science Education, which is the educational arm of the Weizmann Institute, should do the same for science education. We uh, strive to be the best, the most excellent innovators and leaders in science education. A little facts and figures. We were established in 2001, but make no mistake, the Davidson Institute has, as an institute, uh, been on the ground for 14, eight, 17 years now, but the Weizmann Institute has been dealing with science education for more than 50. We have approximately 180 professionals. The vast majority of them are uh, MSc or PhD holders from the Weizmann Institute or other academic figures, uh, other academic institutions, uh, scientists who decided, like me, that science education is their passion. Uh, we have annually approximately 350,000 participants in our different programs, more than 2,500 teachers from around uh, Israel. This is just high school teachers. And we have today the leading science communication website in Israel with more than 3 million users, but that's not the impressive number. The really impressive number is that our analytics show that these users are staying on each page an average of 4.7 minutes. That means they're not just browsing, they're actually reading. How do we do it? Uh, generally speaking, we have a network of continuums. The first one that I'd like to describe is the continuum of expertise. We work in our programs to develop everything from scientific literacy for all, for those decision-making on an everyday basis, all the way to developing and uh, enhancing the next uh, scientists of Israel. The best students that we have, whether in middle school, high school, or young adults, take them, create programs from them, and bring them into uh, science uh, as scientists. I should emphasize that our approach to excellence is that excellence is not an achievement on a test. It's a value. It's a way of living your life. And it can and should be found, cultivated, and developed everywhere. In the center of the state, in the periphery, in the rural areas, and in the most vulnerable populations. The next thing is, of course, content, which is very easy to understand, and that is we work on all STEM areas. Uh, chemistry, physics, mathematics, um, computer science, biology, neurobiology, astrophysics, and so on and so forth, all the research areas that are done at Weizmann, the basic research areas, and of course, uh, technology and engineering, more uh, through hands-on fashion activities in our programs. Target audiences, you can already probably get the idea that we really target all sectors of Israeli society. From students of all grades, teachers, because we believe that excellent teachers develop excellent students, families, the general public, and lately we've started to work also with parents because we have found in research that we do that the parents are game changers for children, especially girls choosing science. That's a whole issue in itself. Um, I'd like to say a word about the teachers. Um, Lia Yakoka, for those my age remember that name, uh, a, an industrial businessman in the United States used to say that in a perfect world, the best of us will be teachers and the rest will have to settle for less. So we're not in a perfect world yet, but we do believe that developing excellent teachers are the first game changer of any education, definitely science education. So a few of the programs, and they're all sitting under the uh, title of innovation. We try to develop, implement, and disseminate innovative, state-of-the-art, cutting-edge, hands-on creative programs, and I will give a few examples. Science communication, as I said, we are the leading science communication um, uh, organization in Israel. That means that we have students, uh, participants in our programs, PIs, anyone who has interest in science and can write for the general public to make science um, admissible for everyone is in our science communications program. The science that we do is active. Every program is very hands-on. We do not do, uh, we try not to do what I'm doing right now, and that is stand and lecture. 
We try to get everyone involved, engage, makering, um, um, fab labs, anything that they can do to uh, explore, discover, and try, and fail and try again. We are taking some of the uh, young, um, excellent students in science that we have from high school, and what we're trying to do with them right now uh, for the past few years is to turn them also into leaders. They are not just excelling in science for themselves. They are working and giving back to the society already in high school or right after high school uh, in different science programs. We have a science garden and museum, an outdoor science garden and museum where families with young children can come and enjoy uh, activities outdoors exploring different scientific phenomena. We have many programs that deal with blended learning. Um, we take different uh, subjects, disciplines from STEM, and we develop them, things that the Ministry of Education in Israel unfortunately does not do, but then we'll teach them. We develop them in ways where um, high school students or families and the general public can go online, study these courses, but they also have face-to-face -face meetings uh, at different uh, times during the year. We do have uh, a youth village, so you're invited to come to the programs. We do have beds for you. Uh, and uh, iScience, which is a program where we actually take the digital arena and we harness it to develop several programs that are um, different. For example, we have a program called iScientist. Um, is anyone familiar here with JDate, where you date a person? So we have SDate. That's data scientist. Uh, a teacher goes online, they have an app. They can choose out of a list of 120 scientists and uh, create a date with that scientist. The classroom will study the uh, area of research of that scientist. And on the day of the date, he, doesn't, he or she doesn't give a lecture. Um, they actually all go online. And that scientist, the classroom has already prepared questions and the scientist will have a discussion with the children. We accompany them in preparing the children, preparing the uh, teacher, and then afterwards discussing um, what they've learned. And last but not least, we are doing this on the global well level as well. We have several programs from uh, summer camp, for, uh, international summer camp where we have uh, both the high school students and young adults come for a month to the Weizmann Institute. They engage in research, they engage in activities, and um, it's all done through uh, the uh, professionals at the Davidson Institute and the Weizmann Institute. The Safe Cracking Tournament, uh, which if I have a minute I will describe. It's, uh, we take, it's, a, it's a global tournament. We have uh, um, high school students usually seniors coming in from more than 17 countries all over the world, they have to build a safe, a physical safe with, that is locked. And they have to crack the safe. The uh, cracking of the lock is based on laws of physics. So they have to make sure, and it's a very creative safe. It also has to be very artistic. So they have to, they come to the tournament in March every year from more than 17 countries, and then they have three things that they have to do. First of all, they have to make sure that nobody else can crack their safe. It needs to be sophisticated enough. They need to try to crack every, everybody else's safe. And they also have to answer questions um, to a judging committee that is comprised of leading physicists in, from the Weizmann Institute, who actually come and ask the children, the, the high school students, what exactly and how exactly their safe is working. So we're making sure that they understand what they actually did. It's an amazing tournament, and we don't have a group from Austria yet. So I guess that the bottom line is that we're all infested with a passion to fly. That's what we want to do, because we all believe that electric light did not come from the continuous improvement of candles. And our job as the educational um, institution of the, the Weizmann Institute is not to improve candles, it's to invent light altogether, reinvent it for the next generation of the 21st century. Thank you.
Thank you, Leah. Thank you so much for this inspiration. Um, I would like to move on and ask Michelle, Michelle Weber to come to the stage, which, by the way, also means to say hello to an alumna. Good to see you back here on campus. Uh, now you work for the National uh, Research Fund at Luxembourg, uh, and there you're in charge of the programs for science and society. And I think this will be also the content of your keynote, right? OK, so I leave the stage, and the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, first of all, uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to be back here on campus about six years after I left, after my postdoc. And uh, so thank you for the invitation. And um, I want to talk today a little bit about my new career, which is in science communication and science outreach, also some science education in Luxembourg, my home country. Um, but before I get to that, I want to actually start with a little experiment. Um, I have here two beakers of water. You have to believe me, there is just tap water in there. And it's about one and a half liters. And I have here an apple and a pear. And now I want you to think for a moment, what's going to happen to that apple and that pear if I drop it in the beaker of water? <laughs> Will they sink? Will they float? When will one sink and one float? So you made up your mind? Yeah. Okay, let's find out. So the apple floats. But the pear sinks. So who was right? Okay. And who of you didn't know the experiment? Ah, good. Okay. Now, what I want to use this for is to illustrate um, actually how we teach at the FNR uh, science education. Um, this is something we frequently use in our teacher trainings. And um, your next question would probably be why. But instead of telling you or the teachers or the students, the pupils, the answer straight away, we asked them to come up with hypotheses. You know, why might that be that one floats and one sinks? And then you can do experiments to test that. So you could, for example, come up, well, maybe it has something to do with the, the skin. So you go and peel the apple, you peel the pear, you try it again, no difference. Well, then you might say, okay, it has to do with the weight. Okay, so you weigh both, and then you cut the pear so that it has exactly the same weight as the apple. You try again. Um, still the same result. Then you might think, okay, maybe it has to do with the shape. And then you, do, you cut out a cube of exactly the same size of the apple and the pear, and you drop it, and still the pear sinks. And so step by step, you get closer to an answer, and ultimately, with a little bit of help, the answer is to do with density. So the pear is denser, and therefore it sinks. But what I want to point out here is this is what's called inquiry-based learning. So instead of teaching the, the children or the adults, in, your, in this case, the answer straight away is to explore together what the answer is. And so that's how we try to teach. Um, there are different three E's here at the, than, than the title of the, of the event. You first want to engage your students. I'm going to call them students, it's audience, whatever. You want to grab their attention. You want to surprise them with a wow effect, and I think with the pair dropping, a lot of you didn't expect that. And then you want to go and explore together what could be the reasons for that observation you just made. And then after many hypotheses and experiments and trial and error, you explain or you find your explanation together. And if you want to do this really well, you then go and leave the students to extend their just newly gained knowledge. You maybe give them grapes and oranges and bananas to test what they will do in the water. 
and you try and evaluate what they learned from this experience. So now that I have your attention, hopefully, <laughs> I can introduce you to the National Research Fund in Luxembourg, who I work for since 2014. Um, so we are um, the main funder of public research in Luxembourg, and that means our main job is to manage uh, public funds and in, give them in a competitive manner to research projects and researchers, just like the FWF in Austria, for example. And we focus on some core strategic areas, but we basically fund across all domains, so from social sciences to natural sciences and computer scientists, sciences and educational sciences, by the way, too. Um, but we have a very important second role, and I, I will explain in a minute why, which is to promote scientific culture in Luxembourg. And this is usually quite rare for a funding agency, um, but this is a very important second mission that we have, apart from also advising the Luxembourg government. But we do operate in an autonomous manner. We have a, a budget from the government, but how we spend it is pretty much up to us and a four-year strategic plan. And our vision is to establish Luxembourg as a knowledge-based society, so it's quite similar for us. It's important that uh, we live in a society that is aware and uh, in support of research and science and innovation, and that it's important for the country's future and economic diversification. And in Luxembourg, this is quite a challenge, because this very busy slide just summarizes that it's a very young research location. In fact, the first public research institutes were just created uh, 30 years ago. So we are not a nation that has hundreds of years of science and research experience. The first university in Luxembourg was only created in 2003. And the Luxembourg National Research Fund was actually created in 99. And so, this is a very young research location, which is an opportunity, but also a challenge. So it means we had to build everything up from scratch, and also we had to uh, explain to the public why this is important and why so much taxpayers' money is going into this. And it's significant. This shows the public investment into public and private research over the last 15 years, and it has risen tenfold. So. That's our job uh, in the science and society team. And we sit on this campus in the south of, country, uh, south of the country, which is actually a, a big urban re uh, development project on a previous uh, steel uh, foundry, where uh, now most of the research actors are located together. And so it's a bit like here at IST Austria. There's a campus that has risen out of nowhere, and there's all the time a construction site still. So here on the eighth floor, I sit with my team of um, science communicators um, and um, some event and communication managers. And together, we basically try to um, stimulate and reward the exchange between science and society um, by offering a variety of platforms. And these can be grouped pretty much into four groups, events, um, web and media presence, training, and funding programs. And in each of those, we interact and collaborate also with teachers, schools, and educators. And all of these activities are open to them as well. And I will now uh, explain, show a few examples of each of these. So, this is a short snippet from a science festival. So it's one of our events that we organize to encourage face-to-face -face exchange between researchers and, uh, sci and uh, society. Um, and these are uh, more and more popular and taking place in alternation every year. So researchers offer educational workshops, but also scientific debates. And in fact, what we do for both of those events, we reserve uh, particular days just for the schools. And on those days, we ask the scientists to specifically adapt their speech to include, like, a focus on scientific method and, you know, hypothesis building to really take the time to do some science education 
Because then during the weekend, it's the rush of families that come with small children, and quite often there's not even enough time to explain uh, everything in detail. But for the schools, we focus on the scientific method. We have another very popular activity uh, where we send researchers into schools. It's called Chercheurs à l'école, um, where they go and talk about their career, so how did they become a scientist, but also about their research. And this is a really important event because it's quite often the first time that pupils, this is high school pupils, come into contact with a real researcher. And the, they quite often present their research in a way that links to the curriculum. So this, this, the pupils, they see, ah, so this is what I had to learn this physics law for. And uh, that's a really important event. And, and in fact, many students, have, uh, pupils have come back to us and said that it inspired them to at least con consider a career in, in science. We, it's a bit too young to track the, the impact of it yet, but uh, at least what we can say is the number of researchers who want to take part in this activity is, is continuously rising. I must say, Luxembourg has 40 uh, high schools. We have a population of 600,000, so this is okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, oh, I forgot to start the movie, so there were some, some images of the, the scientists interacting. Now, um, the second um, platform is web and media presence. This is Mark Schiltz, our Secretary General. And um, you might think that he's the most famous FNR employee, at least in Luxembourg. Well, he's not, I'm afraid. It's this guy. This is uh, my colleague Joseph. He's called Mr. Science, and he has a TV show and radio programs where he basically promotes science to the public. And in fact, here he's just performing the apple and pear experiments with a group of uh, school children. And so he quite often actually in his program interacts with school children and, and classes and runs experiments with them together. And, and his uh, part of the show is always focused on answering a question through an experiment. So that's, for me, it's really also something that is science education. He Ex he explores an idea with an experiment and uses it to explain um, the science. Um, secondly, we have a website um, where we publish news about research articles in Luxembourg, um, video portraits of scientists um, in three languages, which is always a challenge in Luxembourg. Um, and this is, was created in 2013 and is, has rising popularity. So the main focus of this is science communication. But we have now this guy uh, sitting in our office and we're very excited because he's a primary school teacher and he um, is detached from his teaching duties one day a week to come and work with us and to take content that is present on this website and develop it into lesson plans that the teachers can use in their classroom, hopefully next year, from next year onwards. Oops, oh, went too fast. Um, we also offer training um, to scientists, how to communicate with the media, for example, but also teacher training. So the apple and pear experiment I uh, demonstrated here is part of one of our teacher and educator trainings, which teaches them inquiry-based learning and science. And these are, the good thing is these are now recognized through the National Institute of national uh, education, so the teachers get credit for professional development taken with us through these courses. And last but not least, um, we have dedicated funding programs to support other actors, and this includes teachers and educators, um, to run their own science education or science outreach activities. And this is our Promoting Science to the Public program, which has two branches. One is for smaller projects that last up to one year, and a lot of, actually one third of the projects that we fund are either projects uh, run by teachers or in schools. And they're, so they're quite popular with teachers. And then we have um, a, a new program, our flagship program, which is for 
projects that have um, the goal to have a, a, a more longer lasting impact on the system. So these are funding that we give for up to three years. And uh, you can also ask for personnel costs, for example. And I want to um, finish by presenting two examples of projects that we funded with this program that are in the science education domain. Um, one is um, the Site Teach Center, which is a collaboration between the FNR, the University of Luxembourg, and the Ministry of Education. And it's basically a, a resource, resource and training center for primary school teachers for their natural science teaching. So it's run by a science education specialist at the University of Luxembourg, and teachers can come there for advice for professional development. So the education specialists run workshops on how to teach um, inquiry-based science. And, and also they have a resource center where the teachers can come and hire, um, borrow material for use in their, their classes. And this is a new project that has been running for about uh, two years. And the professional development that is offered is both for teachers that are already in service, um, but also for teachers who are currently being trained to be teachers. And in fact, for teachers who are currently being trained, it's compulsory now which is really good. It, it didn't used to be part of their, their training. And uh, that's, I guess, a bit similar in many countries. In Luxembourg, the primary school teachers, they traditionally don't have a science background. Quite often, they have a language background. And they basically, the last time they were taught science was quite often many, many years ago. So many of them don't feel confident to teach science in their classes and definitely don't know how to use inquiry in their teaching practice. So um, with this project, we hope to have a lasting impact. And in fact, uh, the demand is, is high, and in, they want to now expand to also teach um, in the actual schools, not just at the center. The second project I just briefly present is the Scientines Lab at the University of Luxembourg. And this is a university lab for high school students. So it's an experience for high school students. They come onto campus for one day with their teacher. And they basically uh, spend a day as a scientist. They do experiments in either biology, physics, or mathematics. And they really run experiments on equipment that scientists at the university use. And this is a dedicated teaching lab, though, so it's not a, a lab used by scientists. It, the material is all just for the teaching uh, lab. And this is extremely popular. Um, the Scientines lab for this school year is fully booked, and for next school year, they are half booked. So this is, has had an enormous success, and uh, the, the feedback from the, the students is, is really positive. And just to give you an example, I mean, this, the video shows now the biology lab. But uh, for example, they also run a mathematics uh, course where they teach the students um, the mathematics behind the RSG algorithm. And uh, it's, it's really, I mean, I myself attended the workshop recently, and I, I used to hate mathematics at high school. And now I finally could see the use of Euclidean division and prime numbers, and it was really fascinating for me to follow this course. And it was what was even more fascinating was to watch how the students actually understood much more than I did. Well, that's maybe not surprising, but um, they were really closely paying attention, and they could really follow everything that, this, that they explained during the workshop. So that leaves me with just a few conclusions. So maybe some things that we've learned in Luxembourg. Um, I guess two are for mainly destined for teachers. Um, you don't need to be an expert in science to be a good science teacher. And really, it's all about you know, daring to enter into that area and just you know, explore what's out there. But first, think about how to engage your audience, so your students it's maybe more important than to think about how to explain the science. I guess the, the third one is for both scientists and teachers, the collaborations between the two are really important. For us, 
all of our science edu education activities, they wouldn't work without the collaboration of teachers. They need to test it in the field, how it works. And maybe this is the last, is more an advice for the scientists. It's not always necessary to have a link to the curriculum, but it helps the teachers to identify with the topic. So if you as a scientist can think to link your science to the curriculum, you help the teacher. But yeah, I think for all, what really uh, is the key take home message is go and explore and find your explanations together. Thank you. So thank you, Michelle. Thank you again for this very inspiring talk. And now it's time to move on from the keynotes to our panel discussion inputs. Uh, and Michael is standing next to me. Um, welcome, Michael um, Eichmeier. Uh, you're a professor for mathematics at the University of Vienna. And he's also the mastermind and the um, leading figure, the catalyst, whatever, uh, of Mathematik macht Freude, Freunde, which is an initiative that was uh, started by you. And we are now eagerly awaiting your input for the panel discussion. And afterwards, the next panelist will take over. So, Michael, the floor is yours. So uh, my name is Michael Eichmer. Lukas Rigler, who is also on this slide, is my right hand in this project. Uh, he's a, a teacher. The project is called Mathematik macht Freude, Freunde. And the focus of this... Oh, dear. Um, and the focus of... Uh, and the focus of the project uh, is the training of future mathematics uh, teachers in schools. Uh, so the training of secondary school mathematics uh, science teachers, any teachers in fact on uh, secondary school level is a joint enterprise in Austria between the pedagogical academies and the university. Pedagogical academies perceived as practical, universities as uh, being, you know, being perceived uh, as academic. Uh, this particular project is uh, uh, a joint enterprise between uh, the Pedagogical Academy of uh, Lower Austria and the University of Vienna. Uh, so uh, I'm a full professor at the University of Vienna and the chair for global analysis uh, and differential geometry. The reason I'm telling you this is to uh, point out that there's no description of teacher's training in my uh, job description, no mention of it. Uh, so what I'm doing here is a, is a hobby project and I care a lot that the public understands. Um, that this is something that I'm doing because I th think it's important. Um, so as a mathematician, as a professional mathematician, I'm trained as a problem solver and problem solving, solving problems uh, is what every teacher does every day and that's definitely something that we have in common. The question that we're asking ourselves uh, in my project Mathematik macht Freude Freunde is just how we can go about enabling and supporting students who train to be uh, mathematics teachers to solve real problems uh, as part of the education. So uh, uh, just to give you one idea how we are doing this, here is a, a bunch of my students, of my mathematics coaches. Uh, so the week before Easter, uh, 47 of my students, uh, graduates of my, my project, uh, work with 270 high school students to prepare uh, for uh, the matura, for their school leaving exams. Uh, so watching them do this uh, makes, makes the project worth it for me. There, there will be wonderful teachers out there. What you're not seeing in this uh, uh, picture is uh, 14 professionals, and I really mean professionals in different areas, who ca uh, come together to support uh, this, tw uh, this team of uh, aspiring mathematics teachers. Uh, so a few more uh, uh, details. Um, so the project is uh, now in existence for three years. Uh, last year, in the second year of the project, uh, my students have worked intensively. So I mean, not just you know in one-off events, but really over a longer uh, stretch of time with over 1,000 uh, teenagers in a, a variety of formats. Um, two of these formats are these intensive studying clubs. So this is when uh, high school students come to university, come to the Pedagogical Academy in Lower Austria, uh, to their campus in Baden. They spend an entire week there with my students. Um, brushing up on their mathematics and hopefully also changing their attitudes in many ways uh, towards mathematics. Uh, another uh, format that we have is the Vorkurs Mathematik. Uh, it's a week-long bridging course for students entering STEM subjects at uh, uh, Austrian universities. So the idea is that future teachers work with uh, uh, entering university students uh, to make sure that this transition is working well. 
Um, so with uh, uh, 2018, so this year we're expanding uh, very quickly, and it's the natural course of the project. We expect to be working with over 2,000 students, um, high school students and beginning university students total. Uh, so with all of these projects, it's very important for me that you, that you take away uh, that while we are helping to support high school students and while we are hoping to support students entering universities, everything I do in this project is to help produce better teachers. So this is the ultimate goal. So I'm assisting teachers developing um, they're honing their skills as best as I can. Uh, so how do I do this? So the past uh, two slides were about enabling students to solve real world problems or real problems in our society. Uh, now how do we uh, support them? So the first step for students to become part of my project or aspiring math teachers to be part of the project is to apply uh, with a, a CV and a letter of purpose uh, to take part of an elective course, a Wahlfach, uh, um, you know, um, starting, uh, you know, they can do this every semester, it's run every semester, um, um, you know, starting their, their second semester at university, part of their training. Uh, so I'm the moderator of this class, and I really bring in people who have uh, real expertise uh, in areas that I, I believe and firmly believe are, um, you know, um, there, there can't be enough of this uh, in the background of any teacher. So there's Science Center Netzwerk, for example, uh, they are experts in science, com uh, science communication. There's Fine EFOI, that's gender and diversity, it's an important topic for us. There's Teach for Austria, and we'll hear much more about uh, that uh, from Birgit uh, in, a, in a bit. Uh, there's you know, techniques from classroom management, uh, you know, social dynamics in the classroom. There's crisis intervention, so this I take very, very seriously. A teacher, I insist, the teacher is not a social worker. There may be some overlap. Uh, a teacher has to understand exactly what a social worker does, however. Uh, and this is something that I, uh, we put a lot of emphasis on. And then there's something, there's a good word for it in German, but maybe not so much in, in English, supervision, professionelle supervision or professional mentoring to develop a, a professional sense of one's role as a teacher. Um, so uh, when we started to uh, actually you know, go out and work with uh, high school students, I discovered very quickly that at least to me, uh, all of the materials that I, that I was looking at, that I found around, uh, were not remotely adequate uh, for what I had in mind. And what you do is when you, what you have to do, I believe, when you raise such substantial criticism is you have to try and do better. So we started very uh, quickly to develop our own uh, materials. Uh, I brought together a bunch of research mathematicians, so I'm one of them, so that's actually people who do mathematics for a living. Uh, mathematics teachers, so people who have spent their day in schools uh, trying to relate mathematics uh, to, to average students. Uh, and to bring together uh, the true stakeholders, students of mathematics, both in schools and at university. So all the materials that we are producing are free. Uh, there's unlimited access to them. You can have a look at this, uh, this web page uh, to get an idea. They are Creative Commons materials. It's a license that cannot be revoked. So these materials exist now and for all. We're working to continuously improve them. And I want them, and this is something I insist on, you know, this is something where we should strive, just like the Weizmann Institute, to have the very, very best. You know, we should never believe that what we have in terms of materials or in terms of uh, science education and training of people who uh, you know, relay science in, in schools, that is our teachers, for that to be good enough. We should always think that we need to do better. So here's a bunch of the materials that we are developing, so many of them have digital features, so printing them is a little bit beside the point. Uh, that's about all the mathematics that you should be learning according to the Austrian curriculum uh, in uh, the, you know, high school. So uh, it's pretty much complete, but uh, uh, you know, we're continuously improving in terms of contents, uh, but we know we can do a lot better, and we will. Uh, so uh, some, if you, uh, some observations uh, to, uh, to take away. Um, so I'm a dilettant in this, and I, I insist on this. And to some level, I also enjoy it. Uh, I found education, certainly in Austria, is a place where a lot of cynicism can be found. That's toxic. Let's please stop do that. Uh, there's no place and should be no place for cynicism uh, in education. Complacency. Uh, thinking that it's good enough uh, about how we teach science and how we train uh, 
uh, our teachers uh, who are supposed to teach uh, science in high schools, that's a running a very, very high risk for society. If you think about how many high school students or you know, primary school students, wherever the teacher is teaching, is teaching at any given point, multiply that by 40, right? That's the, that's the years a typical teacher spends in school, right? Think about what is at stake on a single teacher and what the impact can be uh, on society. Uh, thirdly, uh, it's completely unreasonable and extremely dangerous to expect teachers to act professionally in ways that are neither part of their training nor part of their personal experience. And yet it is something that we keep on doing. Um, uh, number four, there's a very good chance that you sitting here with me at IST, just like me, uh, are here because we lucked out on our science education. We are the lucky ones, right? We were lucky. So please go celebrate a dedicated teacher, maybe your own, and help train another. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to ask um, Marika Zielinski to join me, uh, Program Manager for Citizen Science at the ÖAD, which is officially the Austrian Agency for International Mobility in Education, Science and Research. That's a very brief translation. Um, we put the presentation for you ready, and then you can start off. The microphone is here. Okay, hello everyone. So I was already introduced. My name is Marek Zislinski. I'm uh, working for the Center for Citizen Science at the ÖAD. The long name in English was already introduced as well. Um, it was established in 2015 by the Ministry of Education, Science and Research. And today I would like to introduce to you one of our initiatives, which is called the Citizen Science Award. For us, it is a best practice example in the cooperation of science schools and society. But before I'm gonna tell you more about the initiative, I would like to tell you a bit more about what citizen science actually is. So there are at the moment a lot of different definitions um, worldwide. We uh, took this one and so what is citizen science? So citizen science for us is the active involvement of citizens, their knowledge, resources and commitment in research. What is it not? What it's not? It's the involvement of citizens as just mere research subjects or data sources. So if you invite citizens to just answer questionnaires and answer um, questions about their lifestyle or, op or opinions, this is not citizen science. You want to make use of their actual expertise and then it's the participation in research, so citizen science. Okay, so what is the Citizen Science Award actually? Um, the aim of it uh, is that we want to promote citizen science all over Austria. We want to support research projects by gaining citizen scientists to gain data and also um, motivate people to get involved in research. So it is a research competition. As I said, the aim is to motivate all citizens in Austria to take part in research projects. The target groups here are school classes and individuals. It is a competition, so of course there are prizes. And um, for school classes, we have cash prizes, so they can win up to 1,000 euro. And um, for individuals, we have non-cash prizes. So of course, after uh, all the work they did, and if they hopefully won, um, they will get their prizes awarded at an award ceremony, which usually takes place in autumn. And so far, I can say that in the last three years, we involved about 10,000 participants in Austria. So that's, we're kind of proud, it's quite some number for us. But what do we do as a Center for Citizen Science? So at first, we publish a call to invite citizen science projects to become part of the Citizen Science Award. We do support them by giving workshops about um, marketing, um, by connecting them to exchange ideas and so on. 
And the money prizes, they come from the Ministry of Education, Science and Research. And then, as I said, um, there's the final event, the award ceremony, which is also organized by us to celebrate all these wonderful citizen scientists who put so much work into it. And to give you some impression of how it could look like, so here are some pictures of our uh, award ceremonies. We had some in the University of Vienna and also some in the Museumsquartier. So this year, of course, again, we have the Sit and Science Award. Um, we have six projects. It's actually going on right now. So if you have students, if you're interested, it would be great if you could participate. Um, we have a few projects from natural sciences. We have a project from history and also a project from medicine. So uh, as I said, it already started. You can take part until the end of June and maybe one of you will be the winner of our award. That would be really great. So, and here, just to um, introduce to you one of our award projects, this is um, Fascinating Bumblebees, which is conducted by the Naturschutzbund Österreich. The aim is to protect uh, bumblebees and to see where they actually occur. Um, so, um, if you take part, you just monitor, 43 bubble, bumblebee species in Austria send photographs and your observations to the scientists and help science. So what, do we, what did we learn throughout the last three years? After every award, we have a reflection workshop where we um, discuss what was going well, what was going worse, to continuously be able to develop the award. What we found was that, of course, clear rules are really important. So how can people participate? How can they win? Um, clear, rules about, clear rules about the prizes. And what we also found was that recruiting teenagers and school classes which was much more easier than actually individuals, so grown-ups. And of course, quality versus quantity is always um, kind of a challenge because when you have a competition, students always want to win, so they sometimes forget about quality and they, if you, for example, uh, want them to send you pictures, they just send you a bunch of pictures, not really uh, looking if, if it's actually something you can use for research or not. So scientists really have to always emphasize on the quality part. So for schools, uh, what we learned also, of course, and what we know is that teachers are really important supporters because they don't only promote the project, uh, they don't only promote what, is, uh, what the project is about and try to um, communicate it to the pupils to motivate them, but also they are our quality assurances. Um, so what is also um, very important to remember, especially if you want to do an award like this, is that you have to really start early to promote uh, the award or the project, because teachers, of course, they have a lot of uh, things on their mind and a lot of things to do. So they have to know as early as possible what kind of project there is and how they can actually integrate it into their curriculum. What we also found with the award is that there's no ideal participation phase. Like there's always either there are exams going on or there's holiday coming up. So also for us, the participation phase is in May and June and there are final exams taking place then. So, but we had to choose something and that's the best we, we found. Um, of course, what is also important to know for teachers is the duration of tasks. So if you want, um, teachers and pupils to take part in research projects, they should know what, how long the tasks will last in order for them to be able to inter integrate them into the curriculum. Long instructions are rarely read by teachers. Um, unfortunately, also often like um, people prepare a lot of, like scientists prepare long instructions of how the data should be collected and so on and so forth. And teachers think like, okay, well, we'll just figure it out once we're in the field. And then they start to, to read all the um, instructions and it's like way over their head. And so, yeah, um, that's really a, a challenge. And also what scientists should, should uh, consider cooperating with, uh, with schools is that the infrastructure is very limited. 
So sometimes you need rooms, you need a lot of computers, you need software and so on, but often schools just don't have it. So that's also something very, very important uh, to consider because it can also decrease the motivation a lot if, for example, you have some project where you need to analyze data on a computer and there's just two computers for a class of 30 people. That's not really working out. Okay, so that was it from my side. Thank you a lot. Um, if you're interested in the award up there, there's the website, so you can maybe, if you want, take part in it. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Marika. Now I take great pleasure in introducing um, Adriana Leboeuf as our next discussant. Ariana holds a PhD in neuroscience and biophysics from the Rockefeller University, and uh, she studies long-term community self-regulation in ant colonies, and that is important to mention now at the Weizmann Institute. And actually, um, Liat and Adria met here for the first time. So we connect Weizmann people here in, uh, in, in close to Nyborg, which is nice. Uh, Adria is not only a scientist, but also very much involved in uh, science communication, science outreach, and she also ran a workshop uh, today um, with participants at IST Austria, and maybe you can also elaborate on that. She is also a founder uh, and mastermind of Catalyst, which is actually your initiative and where your heart is really at, right? So go ahead, please. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Hello, thank you very much for the opportunity. So our everyday life is absolutely full of science, from the devices we use to interact with the world to the food we eat. And at the same time, there are, is, are many major crises in our public understanding of science, from vaccines to GMOs, etc. Now, let's take a jump over into the ivory tower of academics. Research is requiring people to be more and more specialized in their training. And, again, at the same time, the careers within academic research are becoming increasingly scarce. So here we have two problems, and for me, I see a wonderful solution that can, can partially help both of these problems. Okay? So in this gap, I founded the Catalyst, which is a nonprofit organization composed of scientists, uh, science enthusiasts, science communicators, who, um, who both uh, create new media for the public about science, and also we train scientists' communication abilities. And we do that mostly through improvisation. So the, my workshop participants uh, got a little taste of one of the things we do, which is train scientists to be better communicators through storytelling, metaphor, in-person communication skills. And I do hope that you'll visit them uh, afterwards during the reception. Uh, they'll be happy to tell you a bit about their research. But in addition, the Catalyst is much more than that. And fundamentally, it's a community. It's a community, as I said, of primarily scientists, active scientists. And how do we get them involved in this? We get them in through the gateway drug of improvisation. So improvisation is it's like, whose line is it anyway? You've maybe seen this on stage. It's comedy, usually. And we bring people in with this very, uh, very cheap, if not free, training, uh, which happens on a weekly basis now in two cities, uh, Lausanne and Geneva. And then they get used to playing together and laughing together. And one of the secrets of improvisation is that it trains people in collaborative creation. How do you create together with other people and have a good time while doing it? So as these people get to know each other, they get this, the desire to create something together. And then we provide a supportive environment and uh, we try to get funding to make those dreams a reality. So uh, drop an improv there. So I'm just gonna tell you very briefly about a few different types of projects that we've done in this space. So we started out doing scripted theater uh, over here. So this is one of my favorite projects. It was called Blue Butterfly. And we were able to do this through a large grant from the Swiss National Science Foundation, uh, which allowed us to work with professional playwrights, professional directors, professional set designers. And then together with a group of many scientists, we built uh, a new theater play about research, about current research and the process of science. Uh, and then all of the actors were also active scientists. 
Um, now, our bread and butter, as I said, is improvisation. And in line with that, we have a monthly show where we have people talk about their, their research and then we sort of digest that and give that back to the public. Uh, it's a lot of fun and again, it also builds community. People from the public who just love science, people who want to learn and laugh at the same time come to these shows, they get to know each other and new projects begin. Uh, then uh, we've also tried our hand at building science games. So my favorite one of these was uh, an opportunity we had to build an immersive game inside a museum. So this is the Museum of Zoology in Lausanne where we built uh, an escape game where the uh, exhibition was the host and the players were the parasite. They had to go in, find a, a way to exploit the resources and then get out. Uh, it was a lot of fun and again, these are active scientists who are building these games and using their expertise together with science communicators to build cool content that everyone is excited about. Then uh, finally, this is a sort of waxing initiative we have. Um, it's doing very well, it's called Exposure. We just got a big grant uh, to expand it throughout Switzerland. I'll just let you see a little video about it. If the, <laughs> no, it's not gonna play. Are you a scientist, filmmaker, artist, or storyteller? Exposure Science Film Hackathon brings together talented and driven individuals to explore science communication through beautiful short films aimed at engaging the public with the wonders of science. The hackathon is made up of three intense days of idea sharing, filmmaking, creativity, and fun. So again, this is three days and they make amazing short films. Um, so in sum, we've had some amazing outcomes since this organization was started back in 2012. Uh, but aside from the specific, uh, all of the different projects that we've done, to me, the biggest success is the number of lives that we have touched. And I'm talking not necessarily about the people who've perceived these things and as audience members, but the scientists. These are people whose lives have been changed by these experiences. They've gotten the bug. They, they learn how amazing it is to, to create something that helps others understand and love the, the natural world. So it's really, it's changed many people's lives. So my learnings here from this experience are that passion is the best nucleator. If you, can make, if you can share your passion about something, people will come. And also, scientists are creative people. They, they want to express their creativity. So if you give them the opportunity to build something, they will. So lastly, let it be joyous. If we can laugh together, we can do anything. So people will get involved and it will change lives. Thank you very much. So thank you, Adrian, for this very inspiring presentation. And again, I just wanted to mention that in the ballroom, there will be the speaker's corner where people can interact and discuss uh, what they experienced um, today, and you can join them by doing so. Um, now, next to enter the stage is Birgit. Um, uh, Birgit uh, Radvanko is presenting to us um, the wonderful case of Teach for Austria. Uh, and that will be uh, an additional input for our panel discussion. And once everything's ready, uh, you can start. Um, in Teach for Austria, you're in charge of uh, innovation development, correct? Right? Yeah. So and you used also to work as a consultant and as a trainer, but now you're in Teach for Austria and they're in charge of innovation development, correct? Okay. Okay, yeah, here you go. Thank good. you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Um, it's quite some time into the evening, and uh, so I want to involve the audience a little bit with uh, two questions. One, uh, how many people of you have uh, a university degree? Can I see a show of hands? Well, I guess it would be high. <laughs> and if you think of your parents, how many of you have one or two parents with a university degree? 
Well, it's quite a high number, not so many as before, but uh, that's, uh, that's quite representative of uh, the problem. And it's good for you, that's not a problem, but the, uh, the other hand is a problem and that's, uh, it's inherited and that's one, uh, well, that's the main reason why Teach for Austria was founded. So I want to uh, bring to you a very different world, probably, than the one you know as scientists. Uh, with two numbers, more than 50,000 young people nowadays in Austria are neither in employment nor in education and to make that more tangible, in one district in Vienna where we place teachers, we have 25% of people in that age group who do nothing. They're not in school, they're not in training. And that's a huge problem for the individual, but obviously for society as well. That starts much earlier, obviously, and that's just one number, and you can see a lot of statistics. At the age of 10, children from underprivileged backgrounds have lost up to three years. That's standardized testing um, of different kinds compared to children from academic backgrounds. And as you can imagine, that's hard to catch up on. And they don't catch up as standardized testing shows at the age of 14 and, uh, and all statistics. So Walter M. Berger, the founder of Teach for Austria some six years ago, said uh, that's wrong and many people joined him in that assessment. And so Teach for Austria was founded with the vision every child should have the chance to lead a good life regardless of how much money, how much education the parents have. Now you would say that's pretty obvious, who would disagree? And still numbers show that it's a very different reality in Austria. Now that's a huge vision obviously. What's the contribution that Teach for Austria does in that regard. We select uh, university graduates and put them into disadvantaged schools to teach for two years. And that's done in a very thorough process. And uh, here's just um, a short overview. So there is an online application, telephone interview assessment center. And that process uh, will select you know, the best that we see will be fit for that job. And that means, will they be ready to teach in a disadvantaged classroom in a very challenging school? And are they ready to take on leadership challenges, not only in those schools, but later on? And that's the alumni perspective. Those two numbers show uh, we had about 700 online applications this year, and 60 people in the end will start the program and start in the schools. So get an idea of the, how selective it is. They are trained, prepared and supported before they uh, go into teaching and during the two years they teach and they're placed as full-time teachers with all the challenges they face, uh, like their colleagues, in disadvantaged schools. And then they will continue uh, to fight for educational equity as alums. Uh, that's you know, uh, several cohorts last year at Summer Institute. We have uh, over 120 alums so far. Uh, right now, it's 88 fellows, we call those teachers fellows, um, placed in Vienna and Lower Austria, starting in Upper Austria this year, where the situation in, in larger cities is quite comparable to uh, uh, schools in Vienna. And uh, over 13,000 uh, kids are reached right now by fellows and alums. So we have a number of alums who stay on in the teaching profession. And to give you an idea of the people we choose, they're from different backgrounds. They have studied all kinds of subjects, uh, but not teaching or pedagogy. So it's about 20% from, um, from the Mint field, about 27% uh, with a business background and then 50% from all kinds of fields. And I'm always surprised what subjects and specializations you can take. We have a person with a geography background specializing in avalanches. We have a, a physics um, PhD. We have someone, people who've worked in a pharmaceutical company for six years in lab and now teach biology in a, um, in a secondary school. 
So it's a very diverse group and they bring something else to the system as well. Yeah, here is an overview of what the alums are doing. Um, so far, we are in this, in this sev we are uh, recruiting the seventh cohort now. Um, we experience about half of the people who joined the program will stay on in teaching beyond the two years. And obviously, I can't say for how long, but, uh, but they, they are still in, in teaching. And it means that someone who has chosen a, yeah, with a physics background, for example, has chosen the secondary school in the 21st district in Vienna uh, over a graduate degree at MIT, is now uh, part of the teaching profession. Um, and some 20% 20 more, 20 more will stay in the area of education. So that's almost 70%. And uh, so those are people who otherwise wouldn't have chosen the teaching profession. Yeah, some reflection. I was going to write hypothesis and then I thought it was too risky in that scientific environment. <laughs> so um, re some reflection. How you select teachers, prepare them for school reality and support them on an ongoing basis is vital for their success. Also, you would say that's not really surprising, obviously. You know, I would, uh, I would support that. Um, it's not the reality right now. New paths into teaching, that's an important point, as I said before. So we have created one path where people can join the teaching profession who otherwise would not have done it and bring something new to the system, but also to them individually. And when it comes to 21st century skills and competencies, we hear that a lot. What should our kids do and be able to, to do in the future? We have to equip people who teach in schools. We hear it about the kids, but who are the teachers who are going to convey that? So they need the ability and the opportunity to live and convey those skills. So if we want self-confident kids, we need self-confident teachers. If we want kids excited about science, we need teachers who are excited about science. If we want our kids to be leaders and exercise leadership, then we need teachers who are able and have the opportunity to do that. Because, and that's my last point, and teachers and parents who are here will know that kids don't do what we tell them, they do what they see us doing. Thank you. Thank you, Birgit. Thank you so much, Birgit, uh, for this uh, input. Um, and I made a mistake before. You're in charge of progress innovation. Um, so that was, I think, the the correct description. OK, sorry for that. And now we have to improvise a little bit, because uh, Eva Benkova can't be with us here today, uh, because she would have been uh, the final panelist um, presenting an input. And we therefore decided to improvise in a way which is made possible by, by a video. So we will now have a little bit of an insert uh, of a project that has been carried out here and developed here at ISD Austria together with uh, the specialists. And it is called um, how plants dance, we plants and tanzen. And this is a kind of summary of what the project is about. And if the technique is working, if everything is fine running, then please just set off. IST Austria is a young and growing institute dedicated to basic research in the natural, mathematical, and computer sciences. But today is not your average day at IST Austria. 20 students from a local primary school are on campus to take part in a pilot project, How Do Plants Dance? This project aims to get students excited about science, encourages them to stay curious and to develop their own hypothesis and test them. Christina Artner, a plant scientist in Eva Benkova's group, carried out experiments with the students. The Ziel des Projektes is einfach die Forschung anderen Menschen näher zu bringen, die sozusagen keine Forscher sind. Wir als Forscher sind gewöhnt, immer untereinander zu sprechen und wir sind excited, wir, wir sind begeistert von dem, was wir tun, aber das dringt dann oft nicht nach außen. Und gerade solche Projekte sind dafür da dass wir sozusagen den Kindern die Möglichkeit geben, zu sehen, dass wir begeistert sind und die Begeisterung zu übertragen. Diese Pflanze, wir werden diese Reservstoffe 
A successful cooperation between science and school also needs an expert who can connect the two worlds. Es ist nicht so sehr darum gegangen, dass wir jetzt hier Faktenwissen vermitteln wollen, sondern wir wollten den Prozess, wie Wissenschaftler arbeiten und Wissenschaftlerinnen arbeiten, vermitteln. Und wir haben den Schülerinnen einfach sehr viel Freiraum gegeben, selber Forschungsfragen aufzustellen und dann Versuche dazu zu planen. During the project, students learned about science and how science works in a natural, curiosity-driven way. Am meisten Spaß gemacht hat, dass wir in der Gruppe arbeiten durften. Ich liebe, wenn man Sachen forschen kann und wenn man dann auch so Experimente durchführen kann. Das ist einfach interessant, weil keiner weiß, was die Auflösung ist und deswegen mache ich das so gerne. For the primary school, VS Abrechtstrasse, How Do Plants Dance? was a definite success. Kinder waren begeistert, jetzt hier sich als Forscher betätigen zu können und auch das Überlegen einer Forscherfrage, also wie können wir so etwas stellen und so, also das war etwas ganz, ganz Tolles. Die Kinder sind immer begeistert, wenn sie praktisch arbeiten dürfen, ja, wenn sie selber handeln dürfen, wenn sie aufgefordert sind, auch über Dinge nachzudenken. Ich finde, sie bringen auch immer sehr viele eigene Ideen ein und das macht einfach das Arbeiten spannend. Ich würde das Projekt sehr gern weiterempfehlen und auch sofort wieder daran teilnehmen, weil die Kinder einfach mit großer Motivation und Begeisterung dabei waren. Didactics expert Christian Birch is excited about bringing the project to a wider group of students. Das Ziel ist, dass wir jetzt hier Unterrichtsmaterialien ähm, publizieren, dass wir die in die Lehrerinnen Aus- und Fortbildung reinbringen und somit vielen Lehrerinnen, vielen Schulen, vor allem vielen Kindern die Möglichkeit geben, sich forschend mit Pflanzenwachstum auseinanderzusetzen. Okay, this was a short video on this project we did. Um, and now I think it's time that all the panelists and the keynote speakers join me for a short panel session where we have an exchange of ideas. And I'd like to also introduce Yuji, our bonus panel member. Yuji is the stand-in for Eva. Uh, he's a plant biologist. And uh, maybe all of you join us at the podium, please. All right, perfect. Yeji, maybe I start with you. Maybe we, we turn on the switch on the microphone. Uh, yeah, that should work now. Um, Yeji, you're a plant biologist by training, by educational training. You're a scientist here at ISD Austria, but you're also father of two children. Uh, and my question is, t thinking about science education, where do you think is room for improvement? What are your observations? from one perspective, being a scientist, on the other hand, being a father, and thinking about science education as something important, I guess, because there is an academic background in this family, I suppose. Well, so I have to thank my children that I'm sitting here, because that makes me qualified to, to compare the education systems. And I think I am qualified because my children were going through three different education systems in three different European countries. We have plenty of friends and colleagues that have children in, in all other different countries and we do often complain and talk about education systems in different countries. So I think generally for science education the main problem and that I think everybody knows who, who is a bit scientist is that many schools are focusing on facts and not on understanding of concepts. And so it's probably much easier to teach facts. Also for some students, it's much easier to learn facts than trying to explain concept and forcing the students to understand them and then being also able to evaluate properly whether they understand the concepts. And I think that's, that's an overall in, in all countries that, uh, that we encounter. That's, that's the main problem with science education, in my opinion. In Austria, there is a specific issue, in addition, I would say, and that is that science subjects at high school and primary school, for some reasons, are considered to be less important than in other countries. And it's really like that. You know, in most countries, UK, France, China, 
that would be mathematics, physics, biology, chemistry. In Austria, somehow, the Latin got up. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how, I don't know why. I would like to know, or maybe not, but, but definitely you, you can see it at the schools that, you know, if you are more clever and you manage Latin, go to the better class, and if you are not good enough, go for mathematics into the real gymnasium class. And that is very surprising to us. That's something what we definitely, with me and my wife and my children, didn't expect. And um, I really don't want to start to hypothesize why this is. But it has certainly a consequences, right? The consequences are that if chemistry is something which is not really important, and that is the major feeling in, in, the, in, in the school or in the education system, then it's much easier to teach chemistry or physics like Latin, right? I never believed it's possible to teach physics like Latin, but I saw many successful, successful examples of that, of that in, a, in a couple of schools in Austria. I, yeah, again, Parents are happy because the children can learn it. Teachers are happy because they know what to teach. You know, learn this definition, learn this definition, and you know, everybody is happy at the end. And the fact that you, nobody understands much about what is it really about doesn't really matter for some reason because it looks like that uh, Austria is very much service-oriented economy and society, so so for many people, it doesn't really matter if you don't know what, uh, what, how the world around us function, at least the, the natural world functions. And this is really something what we see less in other European countries. That, was, that is something what is more specific to Austria. Um, other thing which was interesting to see is the children learn a lot. They spend much more time to learn than we are used from other countries. You know, they get more homework, they really learn much more. But it is this formal learning. learning. It is really, you know, one example. I, I could speak for a whole evening, but I don't, <laughs> I, I'm not sure you don't want, you want that. But, you know, one example. We made a birthday party for our kids, and then Several parents approached us and said, how can you do the birthday party on Saturday when there is a test from Latin on Thursday, next week, right? And we, that is not a joke, really. The, the concerned parents, motivated parents that wanted that their they, they children learn well and, and have a good results at school, they basically let us cancel the party because there was a test in five days' time. Uh, so, again, that sounds good because it looks like that the, the, the everybody is motivated to learn, but it's not learning to understand, but it's learning to get better notes, better results at the end, you know, get on the paper something. So I, I made an experiment with my younger daughter. She proudly came in the half a year certificate and said, okay, look, I have only ones and a couple of twos. Are you happy? And I said, yes, I am very happy. Let's, let's do an experiment. Pick one of the subjects, whichever you want, and bring me three at the end of the year, please. <laughs> okay? And that was really completely counterintuitive because the whole class is competing who has better, who has better results and, and how to do it better. So, no, I mean, I think the main, the main issue here is um, somehow make people realize, teachers, students, and parents, that understanding science is important, because that's the main thing that I'm missing here. And, um, you know, I don't think that, a, that some ministry, new law, or new regulation will solve that, because that's a self-perpetuating process. The, the teachers that are teaching now were learning like they are teaching. So they, you know, they learn by definitions, they learn by heart, and that's how they are teaching. And there is no, no way how you, how you can just by, by some you know, global, global kind of thing uh, change it. So I think good thing would be to support the, these local deviations because there are good teachers and we met them. There are fantastic teachers that are fighting hard to 
to actually fighting against the system, trying to do something. And they really don't get much support. They Sometimes they are ostracized both by the colleagues and by the parents because, oh, you want too much that, you know, my, our clever kid, my clever son doesn't manage and so you do something wrong and, and things like that. We really, we really saw that. So I think supporting these, these type of teachers and making kind of uh, programs for science education, programs that wouldn't cost much, you know, I mean, my, my children, Despite being very much science-oriented, they speak fluently five languages, so they are lucky. They can go to the correspondence course in mathematics in Slovakia and to the correspondence course in physics in Czech Republic because nothing like that exists in Austria. And really, there are enough enthusiastic people here with little support you can start these type of things. You can start then the you know, summer schools, weekends for all these things. It is difficult to, for, for a curious kid here that wants to get better in natural science and do something in addition to find a way. Maybe if you are directly in Vienna, you have more opportunities, but outside, very minimal. And these are things that you can support relatively easily, and there would be enough people that would participate, both from side of the teachers and from side of the students. Okay. That was long enough. Huh? Well, thank you very much. Um, Michael, you were involved in teachers' education in math. Would you agree as to a, every, as a hobby? Yes. As a hobby, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> would, you, would, would you? Would you? Would you? Yeah. Okay, but would you agree on almost everything that Yirji said, or no? Okay, please. Um, so I don't have children. Uh, I don't have children in the Austrian education system, but I have an Austrian education. I moved abroad when I was 18, first to the UK, then to the United States. I got my PhD at Stanford, then I was at MIT. Uh, so I met people from lots and lots of different backgrounds. I was never embarrassed about my own school education. So my uh, background in mathematics, descriptive geometry, those were subjects that were taught extremely well in a rural school. Uh, so in fact, my former headmaster is sitting in the audience. I won't tell you who it is. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I had extremely dedicated teachers in this subject, and my education uh, reflects uh, this it turns out my chemistry education, biology, uh, physics, maybe not so strong. My appreciation for these subjects, however, reflects my appreciation for the teachers that I've had in these subjects. So certainly Kloster Neuburg is a very, very particular environment. It's an extremely privileged uh, environment. Um, also, uh, we understand the gymnasium here is, uh, right, I mean, the sozial belastete Schulen, that's the ones that uh, Teach for Austria goes to. Kloster uh, Neuburg is, you know, the other end of the spectrum. My school was uh, somewhere in the middle uh, of, of the pot, large, rural, um, Einzugsbereich, you know, it was a magnet school uh, with a very, very high selection rate. So lots of us dropped out and those who remained. Um, so just to give an example of that, you know, when I was 10 years old and entered gymnasium, of those 30 kids, three of us got PhDs, uh, one in mathematics at Stanford, the other two in Austria, um, uh, physics in Innsbruck, uh, in the, uh, chemistry in Vienna at the uh, um, Universität der Bodenkultur, uh, and all of us were th uh, first generation. So all of us were the first people in our families uh, to get a university degree. I think that's a huge accomplishment. I like what you're saying about supporting teachers. I really, really do, and I think we should do that a whole lot more. Um, so there are lots of people who are trying. Uh, there are lots of, you know, people who try and have a very small reach. And then you mentioned, you know, there's being ostracized. There's, it's maybe not so much about being ostracized. It's just, a, you know, a question of not being appreciated, of not being seen. Um, and uh, of course, there are lots of challenges in the schools that we, you know, occasionally read about in the papers, but we hardly hardly talk about. Um, I think it's important that we, um, as I said in my presentation, I think there's no such thing as a, uh, as you know, training teachers well enough. You know, we should strive, you know, to teach them even better. I learned to, I learned that in Switzerland, you can't ever say something's bad. Right. I, I want to make something good. You have to say, I want to make things even better. So let me try this on you. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we, really, we really, really need to support our teachers. We really, really need to do that. And we need to start uh, in the education. In fact, we have to bring science back into the training of science teachers, um, maybe, you know, to start. And um, um, 
Yeah, and it's a joint enterprise. And as much as we enjoy bickering about what is not working so well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you want to react? Just Mid a very short reaction. So okay, I'm, I'm, those who knows me, they know that I'm overly critical, right? <laughs> so, and now you know it as well. But so I want to say, my two daughters have a fantastic mathematics teacher in Klostermeinburg. But this is one of the local deviations, actually, because really the, 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 general, the general attitude that I do insist is at many gymnasiums that Latin and French are disproportionately more important than mathematics and physics, not speaking about chemistry, because chemistry is really bad. And I, I, I really have a couple of friends having, having children in different schools, and this is, this is very similar. I don't want to say that the Austrian education system is bad. Oh, God, no. But, uh, but if I have to compare it to what is different here, then, then this, this more focus at the high school on the humanities is, is obvious. No? Okay, obviously we have here a place where we do not agree, or we agree not to agree. Lia, do you want to comment something on the importance of teachers uh, and how balanced subjects can be or should be? Well, um, as I said before, uh, teachers are the game changers in science education, but we're, the, the discussion that we're having here um, is the discussion of yesterday. What we used to teach, what we had, our amazing education, the, uh, we're looking to replicate the amazing education that, or not that we had for our children, I already have grandchildren, um, but we're in the 21st century. It's a very different day and age. And I think that we need to go back to basics and ask ourselves the basic fundamental WH questions. Who are our students today? They're not the same people that we were when we were studying in schools. Who are the kind of teachers that we want them to have? What are the characteristics of both of them, of the kind of interaction that they should have? How and where should they be interacting and teaching and learning? Is it all the same, more of the same traditional approaches that we have, just a little bit refined? Or should we revisit these questions and give them different kinds of answers? So um, I think that we're, we all feel that our education was better or less. Um, but we came out good, we're sitting here, and we're successful, and hey, we did good, so the education system is probably doing something well. That's like we say in Hebrew, uh, no, not exactly, because um, it's a different world today. And um, let me just give you this image. If um, one of the Wright brothers came back, The first flyers, aviators, 115 years later, they wouldn't recognize airplanes. We definitely would not want to fly with one of them. <laughs> If a doctor came back from, 2000, from 1912 and walked into a hospital, they wouldn't know the environment, they wouldn't know the medicine, they wouldn't know how to, they wouldn't even recognize most of the diseases. We definitely would not want a doctor like that to treat us today. A teacher comes back from 1901 <laughs> to the classroom. You knew where I was going with this, didn't you? <laughs> and they'll walk into the classroom and they can literally almost pick up where they finished a uh, hundred years ago. So, especially in Latin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's probably true for 500 years ago as well. <laughs> And I'm not saying that it's not important, but it's a different world. So maybe we need to, even if we do ch uh, choose the same subjects, the disciplines, I'm, I'm, my argument is that the subject areas are less important right now, not because they're not important, but because for the education system, even if we do choose to teach Latin or science or whatever we do, Uh, we need to make it adjustable to the 21st century and its goals. It's a flexible, changing, dynamic society, and we need to create children who understand how to live in a flexible, dynamic, changing society. We're teaching them subjects for professions that tomorrow won't exist. Okay. And then we want them to be 
good and uh, uh, contributing citizens to society. So I think we need to revisit the very basics. Okay. Thank you, Liet. Um, Marika. So um, I feel the need to uh, throw in a really amazing instrument that we actually have in Austria, which is a funding program. It's called Sparkling Science. It was already mentioned today one time. Um, so in Sparkling Science, uh, we fund research projects where scientists work together with pupils, like on real current research questions. So they're real re research projects and the pupils experience how it is to set up a project, um, how it is to find research questions, not in all of them. Uh, of course, the projects are different. In some um, projects, pupils are really integrated from the beginning. In, in some other projects, they step in, in a different, on a different level. But in general, they really work on scientific questions. So it's not just um, presenting them facts but it's what we are all talking today about. They're exploring science, they're exploring what it means to, to answer questions that you have in your mind. So um, the program hope, uh, promotes the curiosity and helps them to really understand what it, is, what it means to, to also fail maybe in science. As we heard, scientists do this a lot. So they also experience that. Um, we have a study um, that was just made to, to see what kind of effects sparkling science had. So what we figured was that, or what was found was that um, pupils not only learn more about the topic, but they also grow in self-esteem, so which is really important for their future lives. Um, the, the teachers, it had also, or it has a big effect on teachers because they are happy to break out of a daily routine, just standing in front of the class and teaching uh, all the same things um, over and over again, right? Um, they, uh, they, they get new inspiration for, for their teaching. They uh, also grow in confidence. They're happy to, to finally work together with scientists. And so there are really a lot of uh, positive things to, to be said about sparkling science. I think it is probably the, a unique program worldwide. So um, yeah, we have this amazing instrument, so we should really um, go out and tell everybody about it because I think it's, uh, it would be great if, if more countries would have it. And I hope that um, also in the future, because this program just finished, but I hope that in the future we will come up with another very similar program, maybe a program for citizen science where we can also not just include um, pupils, but also adults and like get everybody together to experience science uh, more deeply. Okay, thank you. Birgit, you wanted to say something? Yeah. yeah. That should work. Thank you. No. Yeah, that works. <laughs> um, we're building up on what the last two persons said, but your comment especially, because uh, the, the brothers, the Wright brothers, made me think of a visit I did to Boeing some years ago, and we had a great guide who told us uh, they, the, the founders of Boeing were flying in one of those double-deckers and had to lie on the double-decker, whatever you call it, and they landed and they said, we can do this better. And that's how Boeing was founded. And I think we have those examples in the school system. So it's an interesting landscape where there are a lot of double-deckers flying around and a few Boeings. And what makes me wonder is, uh, what does it take so that you know, the whole industry, so to speak, <laughs> will get to the Boeings and, and, and fly on that level? And uh, that's an interesting question because we talk a lot about lighthouse projects and uh, we, 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 we don't have to, uh, we cannot stop to mention, you know, engage teachers, all the great things that are happening in schools, yet uh, it cannot be a coincidence to have a, an engaged math teacher. It has to be the standard. And uh, I also liked your comment before and I want to stress that we need the system to role model what we want to see. And I think um, where there are think some things to be done, because we're asking kids to do that and that and learn that, but where is it coming from? So. Okay, thank you. Adria, mm -hmm. and then Liet. Uh, wonderful points. And I really think that in order to 
do as you were suggesting and be dynamic and really build education for the world that we live in, we also need to be aware of current research. And I think that's a wonderful position that something like the Science Education Initiative at IST could go forward in, is creating these links, like Sparkling Science, between researchers and, um, and educators and the public. Uh, but in order to do those things, we also need to help researchers understand how to do that. You can't just toss a, a postdoc out into the world and say, go. <laughs> Some of them are natural and good at it, but others are going to be terrified and it's going to be a scarring experience for the rest of their lives and they're never going to want to talk to anyone else outside the university. So you need to hold their hands a little bit and, and give people a bit more of that experience about the, the, the magic that teachers feel when they teach and people understand. And I, I think that that this is a, a new direction that should be part of every young scientist's education. Because whatever career scientists, PhDs, go into, they're going to need to know how to communicate. I'd, I'd like to expand on that. Um, we're sitting here at a basic research institution. And at the Weizmann Institute, we have the Davidson Institute. It's a basic research institution that has now science education for many years. And there's a reason to that, which is exactly what you're uh, bringing up. Because, um, well, if you ask the, um, the president of the Weizmann Institute, the current one and the former one, both Daniel Zeifman and Chaim Arari, why should a basic research science uh, institute deal with science education? They'll tell you, because if we don't do it, who's going to do it? Understanding that as scientists, we have an obligation towards society, not just in scientific research, but also to hand over the torch to society. And uh, that's, uh, I think, one of the reasons that I was so happy to hear that uh, the Ministry of Education and Science is one ministry, because understanding that the combination of those two is a powerhouse to build a better community for all in the future uh, I think, well, that's our job. And if we as scientists don't go out there and teach and help teachers teach and teach scientists how to teach, all of the above, um, nobody else is going to do it. And it's our obligation. Okay, maybe that is uh, a very good closing statement of the panel discussion uh, because I look at the time and I think it was a great summary. Uh, if I may say. Uh, maybe a big hand for all our panelists. Um.